Hey everybody, uh, welcome along to our fourth anniversary Q&A episode. Uh, it's, well, we've done a few of these before, uh, notably last year, <laughs> uh, a little bit later on in the year, I think actually we missed the anniversary last time, but this time we're right on time. If anything, we're early, because um, I believe this is, this is going up on the Thursday, our actual fourth anniversary is on Monday. So yeah, welcome along. I am joined by three other people who you definitely will have heard on the podcast before. Uh, feel free to say hi in any order that you feel necessary. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, I am Dragon. I uh, appear on both Pretending with Dice and on Penance RPG. Hello, I'm Eden, and uh, I've been on this podcast since day one. You know my voice well enough. <laughs> Greetings, Earthlings. I'm Mark. I've been on the uh, podcast a few times um, been in the Star Wars game and Call of Cthulhu and most recently Star Trek. Yeah, Star Trek won't have gone live when this goes up, but um, yes, so something okay. to look forward to. Um, mm. So yeah, we've got a whole bunch of questions uh, sent in by uh, listeners, all of which actually have come to us through our Discord server this time around. I think last time was a bit more of a mix with Twitter and things. Um, so yeah, a w- <laughs> bit of a heads up, not a huge amount of these are actually that podcast related um but i feel like we, we we can come up with some fun answers for them um why don't we actually kick things off though with something that is vaguely podcast related with actually a question from you mark um you sent in what drives your choices of games to play and record for pretending with dice is it based on fandom preference or community interest i mean generally if it looks cool i suppose community interest doesn't play a huge amount you know of relevant to you know i'm not sort of scouring going what's the hot game at the moment or anything like that but yeah i mean i guess fandom because we've we've played quite a few that are sort of based on already sort of existing ips and things haven't we and mm-hmm. i mean that was kind of how star wars came about because i was like I, I like star wars let's play star wars and i guess the same thing with <laughs> the star trek one we've been working along on really of like hey yeah the, the, i enjoyed doing star trek i like star trek let's do some more star trek sort of thing but I mean, that's kind of it, really. I mean, mm. stuff like D and D and Call of Cthulhu, I guess, is sort of it could be considered sort of the main, sort of quite mainstream tabletop RPGs, really. Um, but definitely D and D. So yeah. that's sort of I don't know, not like a default, but like it was sort of a good, a good place to start and a good easy place to return to, I suppose. So that's that's sort of how we kind of chose those. But yeah, I don't know. I feel like I'm not good at making decisions. So if like an idea comes in my head of like let's play some <laughs> let's play some Star Trek, I tend to just sort of like go full on into it. D- does that answer your question, Mark? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah, cool. <laughs> I just because I... it's weird having you on the call, given that, <laughs> that you, yeah. you asked the question. <laughs> yeah, uh, I get that. I get that. No, it's a little strange. Um, no, I guess I mean I've done a few of the games for pretending with dice over the years and um i was just curious as to what actually i don't think i've ever kind of put the question to you like what sort of drove the the, the choices that you made to do the, those particular uh, games and how you decide on what sort of comes next i always wondered if there was like a a kind of plan in your head over which ones to do outside of the sort of D fifth edition stuff um um but yeah like but i said not, not that really kind of answers it, yeah. Yeah, yeah only just like oh that would be cool to play that it's kind of usually about the extent of my thought process to be honest you know mm. <laughs> and we started totally. with D because that was sort of what i was playing at the time anyway and you know i didn't have a huge amount of different rpgs on my shelf at that point so it was kind of like it made sense anyway you know it's an easy kind of easy entrance way point and you know even you'd you'd heard of D oh yeah if not played it and um yeah familiarity. it's a little bit easier to convince um mark and uh, Jason with like, hey, this is D&D and it's like a known thing, rather than me putting forward something a bit more uh, obscure to just, and then say like, hey, we're going to do this game that hardly anybody's heard of, you know, whereas d and I was able to, you know, it's a name, people have you know, heard of D&D, that's why we sort of started there, really. Um, it's a lot easier to run something, well, especially if you're recording it, it's much easier to run it if you know it better mm, as well. Mm, for sure, mm. yeah. Um, yeah, and no. it's one of the games that there's an awful lot of like resources out there for as well. So it's like you don't understand something or you're not sure of what do they actually mean with that? Yeah. You're yeah. going to be able to find those answers. <laughs> I mean, at that point when we were starting, I really had only played 
Uh, I mean, in terms of like full blown RPGs, we did we we'd done that uh, old season that season that uh, old campaign where we played Star Wars like way before the podcast that you were involved in, Mark. And, yes, I, I remember it well. Yeah, I, I think I've probably blocked a lot of it out, to be honest. Um, I don't blame you. I don't blame you. <laughs> yeah, some egregious stuff went on in that. Um, yeah. That and then D&D really were the only two I kind of sort of done. So they were initial two sort of choices of like, hey, we want to play the, you know, these. And that, that really kind of was the order that it sort of went in. We did first arc of D&D... Then we'd started the second one and Star Trek Adventures was coming out and I was looking into that and, you know, then so we played that one shot with the Spotlight guys and then I think we did End of the World, but then it was just more D&D and then kind of straight into Star Wars, really, you know, so that was sort of starting with stuff anew kind of thing was sort of, yeah. Then eventually you went on to do, um, you did a bit of Shadowrun as well, I believe. We did, yeah, Eden ran that oh, one. That's yeah. my one, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I was drawn towards just, like I like Shadowrun as a setting because it's got that kind of mix of tech and magic that's quite unusual, and a lot of the tropes in it. Like you already kind of touched upon it, where we started doing Dungeons and Dragons. Like I already had broad familiarity with D and D rule sets, having played video games based on them, and I think a lot of the tropes and the what's possible within that universe are kind of broadly familiar to most people that have seen films like Willow or Legend or like yeah. a lot of us have touched touching points where we can go okay i get what's going on there and that shadow run one was one where i thought okay right this one's a little bit of a step further because it's mixing some of these ideas but the group that we had i thought right we we all know our i like tech concepts and sci-fi and we know our fantasy stuff so we should do all right with this and yeah i think that worked out on that basis yeah yeah like, like you say i mean sort of i guess that would based on your question that's sort of i guess preference and fandom really that falls under that but in like a general term of like hey you know we will we all kind of like fantasy stuff and we like sci-fi stuff so mm. it's easy to kind of get you know as a sort of concept is easy to sort of get into it's like hey we're doing a sci-fi thing this week or hey we're, we're doing D. it's a fantasy world where you're there's elves and dwarves and things you know we all i think everybody's seen lord of the rings at this point you know <laughs> kind of thing <laughs> yeah so that's a fair point yeah it's an easy sell sort of thing you know to yeah other players, where you know. I think that there are some other settings, um, one that I'm kind of fond of but haven't read too much about ultimately because it is very complicated, is uh, Numenera, where that's the, the concepts behind that are about like arcane technology that's been around for like millennia and the idea of technology built on technology te built on technology and lost knowledge and stuff like that where it's all very esoteric. It requires a different kind of mentality approaching it where you're not necessarily adventuring in the same way. You're looking for ideas and that the players all have to be on that path. And that most people, I think, that are playing a lot of these games are kind of of a they're, they're aiming for heroism to some extent, and that within the frame of what we've done so far, that these D and D, Star Trek, Star Wars, these all offer these heroic moments where, yeah, not necessarily that it's been steered away from, but I think that some of those other ones that offer more, I don't know, <sighs> intangible reward are harder to do especially in narrative mm. form, the way that we do. Yeah. I mean, the, the ones that we'd have to maybe put a bit more pre-production time in, in figuring out how it would work on a recorded basis. Mm. Um, I mean, I, I haven't got anything specific in mind, but like in terms of like, well, some of them have got some odd mechanics and things that would be like, well, how is this going to come across in an audio fashion and things? But yeah. Hulu comes to mind with that because that was quite a... Quite a different setup. It's not yeah. really about being the hero. It's about trying to get to the end of a plot line with <laughs> your character sanity kind of intact. It's still like you. It's a very. It's going to be a dire situation, whichever way you look at it. In Cthulhu. Well, we got God with tentacle beard, who's going to arise. But people on Earth are um, doing everything they can to making wake up quicker. So it's it's a very kind of doom laden situation. Where you're not necessarily the hero. You're just trying to survive. Hmm. It's those kinds of mechanics that, you know, make it an interesting one to try and put into a podcast, I think. I certainly enjoyed that one very much. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the conclusion where, yeah, as you say, there wasn't really, like, it wasn't a necessarily happy ending. Like, it was kind of like, well, we got through <laughs> we got through that by the skin of our teeth, and my character yeah. was kind of a broken man by the end. So. <laughs> yeah, you were a gibbery mess by the end, Yeah, <laughs> Almost on purpose, though, at one point, I feel like. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. I mean, to some extent. But then that, that's always the way that I've played where narrative is in mind, that this is being played back. So, like, 
and, and that, ultimately, like that's what satisfies me is uh, narrative consistency with a character that I won't necessarily make the prime like choice in terms of like here's the sensible dice roll. I'm thinking more in terms of like well, what's the moment and what would be the natural reaction of this character? Yeah. Uh, to tie it back to the question as well, like thinking of like things from the flood, that also was, I guess, kind of that th- that was probably the, out of the games we've played the most that was sort of based a bit on kind of community interest and sort of fandom and that. Cause I think originally we were going to way back when I was like, oh, let's play uh, Tales from the Loop. That'd be good, you know, because at the time Stranger Things had just come out, and I was like, it's like Stranger Things the game kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And then the way our scheduling works, by the time we actually were getting around to play, it was like, and the sequels come out, Things from the Flood. <laughs> let's play Things from the Flood. We're going to play teenagers instead of kids kind of thing. Um, so that I was like, it's like Stranger Things, but in the 90s. was sort of how <laughs> I was kind of in my head. And I was like, and I'm still, I still like Stranger Things. Let's keep doing this, you know. <laughs> That's kind of how I got around to that game, I guess sort of thing that that was how i sort of got the interest in that game was like watching a show like stranger things and thinking oh that's cool so that's that's yeah i, I suppose out of the ones we played that's kind of the most that was like riding a current wave of pop culture fandom stuff i suppose for me hmm. um although again we didn't set it in any kind of pre-established thing other than like our own setting but 60 years on so you know putting our own spin on things anyway either way Okay, let's move on. Okay, <laughs> I, I, hopefully we, we've answered what you you were um, oh, wanting definitely. to know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so to to shift gears, uh, we have a question from Jeff Zilla. Uh, if a lion and a shark had to fight, who would win? Where's well, the fight taking place? Well, that's exactly, yeah, that's the question, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> like, if it's a great fight, I've got my money on the great fight. Yeah. If it's a dogfish, I think the lion might have it. And hang on a minute, you've got to answer the question, is the Great White, if the Great White, um, was it built for a Steven Spielberg movie with, and it promptly breaks down? Because in that case, I reckon the line. I think it's 100% down to, like, the arena of the fight. Because, like, if you if you chuck a Great White shark into, like, the plains of the Serengeti, it's not going to do that well. But if you drop a, you drop a lion into the ocean, then the shark's got every day of the week, you know. I mean, surely the fairest fight then is to put it on a beach and have it like the the tide's pretty strong, so that the shark can ride in on the tide and like attempt an attack. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The lion kind of waits, and you've got to wait for the clashing moment between the two and see what happens. So if the lion's smart, the shark will ride in, and it will just swipe at it and get it. You know, try and claw an eye out and jump back. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I think that's the only way to have them kind of like vaguely have a bout that takes place more than like a minute or two. With yes. one or the other floundering in their uh, out of their element, because if you take the shark out of water, it's just going to flip about and have a bad time. And the shark, uh, the um, the lion in the ocean is just yeah, equally bad. I feel like they're 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 different enough that there's no like neutral arena that we can put them in. The beach, like you say, is the closest. Mm. But even then, like it, like if the lion falls into the sea, the shark has the edge. But if if it beaches itself, then the lion has the edge. So there's not really like a battle. Like, oh, the surf isn't like dynamic enough, I suppose, for them both to be okay. Uh, I'm gonna go towards shark ultimately. I think. Yeah. So if it was, <laughs> it was a, my a, if it was a sort of stand-up fair fight, we found somehow found a neutral arena that they both were in. The shark has the has the has the edge. You're saying. Yeah, if it was a, a street shark versus the cowardly lion, <laughs> then yeah, hundred <laughs> percent street sharks. Just um, <laughs> it just dawned on me. There's like, well, what's the only way we can get a shark onto land? Well, street shark, surely. <laughs> mm. I do remember. I do fondly remember street sharks. I, I can remember the designs. It was something that I was never into, but I can, yeah, I can yeah, picture I, them very vividly in my mind. I never really got into mm. street sharks. I try, I'm thinking of like a sort of zero G arena type thing, where we take a, but then then you know this. The only way for it to be fair is to take away the shark's need for water, you know, for breathing. Mm. And then it's, yeah, they're, like I said, they're, they're too different to really pit against each other. It's sort of like a blitz ball arena, but in space. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's yeah. what I was thinking. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I still think it makes a massive difference what kind of shark it is. Yeah. Because, like, sure. some, of the, some of the dogfishes are, like, a foot long. At mm. most, they're really small. Yeah, the lion winning every day there. 
Yeah, but if it's something like, like if it was like zero G floating, I mean, I probably wouldn't put money against something like a goblin shark. Yeah, because they are whale shark. They just swallow the line, wouldn't it? Yeah, couldn't help itself. Yeah, I I think in general we're leaning towards shark here, but uh, on dry land the line has the edge in a regular natural. This is a weird question. We've given it serious (laughs) consideration. I'll be honest. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, I'll be honest. The question has traumatised me a bit because I remember as I think I was about four or five, I was playing in the house and I ran into the living room literally at the very moment that the shark from Jaws comes out of the ocean with its jaws gaping wide and lands on the back of the orca. It was that exact moment. And I absolutely shat myself with fear. Had you not been watching the film up to that point? No, I was, well, my my, my dad were watching it on TV. It must have been on television or the the video on or something. Yeah. In the 90s. And I remember this, just this more of teeth and just, I mean, there's no roar that goes with it, but I, in, in my memory, there was this horrible roar that was with it, and I, I remember screaming, running up to my bedroom, shut, slamming the door and hiding under the covers for about half an hour because I was chilling. I had a similar thing where um, I guess I must have been about five or six, and I crept downstairs because my parents were watching Aliens, and oh. um, they didn't know I was there, and I was kind of like watching from the doorway, and it's that bit right at the beginning where Ripley's having that dream where she's, you know... She, She's still on the space station and she dreams that she's got it. And it, God. yeah. Oh. And uh, I yeah. saw about that bit and then I ran off. And uh, yeah. <laughs> I wasn't like screaming or anything. But it gets me when you go into watching aliens when you're older, kind of the fear sort of sub- subsided. Well, yeah. You know, because. Yeah. Yeah. Gives you an adult, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Chanel. <laughs> okay. Um, Jeff said, I think. Should we jump around between people's questions? Because a few people have given multiple questions. Yeah, yeah why not? Let's yeah. jump around. Okay. Um, we'll go on to um, uh, Kleptothermia, who's requested that I refer to her as my favorite child. Um, <laughs> <laughs> said, are there any games that you really want to play but are too overwhelmed or intimidated by? Mm. Um, I think for me, it's any of the like Vampire the Masquerade sort of mm. ones that yeah. they're just quite intense um oh, to say the least and i think there's just there's a lot of pressure because they're, they're they're quite beloved games by those who play them and i don't really have the sort of ground like, i've never played them before sort of thing and the pressure's there to like if we do play it is to get the vibe right and to, you know not screw it up essentially but also there's a lot to them in terms of yeah. law and things, and it is quite overwhelming. And like I say, the, the just the general sort of subject matter is quite intense. And I think a lot of people that play it play it in a way that's very intense. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, subject matter in Ma- Vampire the Masquerade morally is oh. <laughs> grey is the best you can get. Yeah. Pretty much. It's, it's never going to be mm. good. It's always going to be treading the lines of like just how bad is it going to be. It's it's a very mm. edgy game from my perspective. I've I've played and finished Vampire the Masquerade um, Bloodlines, and that's an undertaking even in video game form. Just in terms of like, mm. I mean, it's fun, but it is very much like it's just edgy all the way through. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think anything to do with vampires tends to be in modern media. I mean, I do have a Vampire Masquerade a rule book and uh, one of the supplements, I think, Fall of Law. And almost every chapter in the book actually has like a, a sort of half a page dedicated to what you should do if you're playing a particular scene and you, you've got uh, players who might be sort of overwhelmed or possibly upset or. Yeah. Sort of not feel um, comfortable with the content that you're describing, and it's and it actually encourages you to stop the game at that point and give people the option if they want to sort of bypass this and make it like a kind of scene that happens off screen. So if something like in Star Trek, something happens, there's a discussion going on, they reach a pause, and it switches to another part of the ship. It's that it's that kind of mechanic which is good in a way because it protects people. Yeah, I'm mean- try this, but maybe I'm prepared for what the full intensity of it i mean safety tools are a good idea in every game really but if yeah. if it's in just the core rule book almost every chapter is going like reminder <laughs> this is quite intense you might need these <laughs> safety tools it's yeah it's a little bit um yeah mm-hmm. it's quite telling um so like i said i mean that that's mm-hmm. the one for me where i'm just like okay i wouldn't mind giving it a go but not on the podcast you know and yeah i think it's much more difficult to release things on the podcast where you're 
with a lot of the the moral grey areas. Mm. Um, just the fact that it goes out as a podcast, you are a publisher at that point. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So you, you have that, you have a responsibility to put things out that aren't going to fuck people up. Yeah. Basically. Mm. Which I, I, you know, I think we skirted quite close to the line with the ending of um, Things from the Flood sort of thing. Um, at least with one uh, particular sort of character moment, maybe. Um, but even at that, it was very. It didn't feel gratuitous. That's the difference. Yeah, mm-hmm. as I think, as I say something like Vampire, or again, you know, or a similar type game, I think is, you know, like I say, it, I guess that would fall under, like I say, in Klepto's question, intimidated by. I guess it's a lot of. There's a lot more to consider when yeah. we're doing it. I guess. Um, mm-hmm. Does that make sense? I mean, I'm not personally intimidated by the subject matter or anything like that, but it's it's a lot. It's it, it's just quite a lot, and I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to do it a disservice, and then I also don't want to sort of. I don't know. I don't know if it would it would seem out of character for the games that we play, maybe sort of thing. Because mm-hmm. we've had some dark stuff happen on the the show, obviously, but I think by and large, like you said earlier, Eden, the sort of heroic kind of moments and things, and the comedy sort of side of things as well, we tend to lean towards quite a lot. Yeah, it's that kind of lev- it's levity, isn't it? I mean, yeah. even 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 Call of Cthulhu when we played that, even that had some kind of comedic moments in it. I mean, just mm-hmm. not not ne- not necessarily deliberate ones, but it just kind of it happened in a few scenes, and it, it sort of made it feel like you know you are playing this kind of really dark and foreboding um, circumstances. But it was it was fun to do it. Mm. But when you do something, I think as you said, when you do something like Vampire, it's it's very intense all the time, and the levity just wouldn't necessarily exist unless you were doing it in a kind of tongue in cheek Buffy or angel style. Yeah. Then fair play. But then again, there is actually a Buffy RPG for that. There's other games that that would, but that would be better suited to that kind of game anyway. That's the thing. So it's exactly. Yeah. 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 In the, the angles yeah. are there with vampire. Cause I can imagine there's things like the Nosferatu are known for running servers and stuff. So you could have a story about a Nosferatu that's deeply into an MMO or something. You can you can have things that are a little bit more kind of like angled towards like okay yeah there's the dark stuff happening over there but this guy not him hmm. he's aware hmm. of it and yes he's on the periphery and maybe he's going to touch upon it a little bit but that's not the focus and I think when I did um, Shadowrun that's another setting that again morally a lot of things in that can get a little bit funky like it's got some dark stuff in its storylines yeah and even within what I did like I think compared to probably the way that you've run things mostly aj like i had like a brothel and it was a town that was full of sex shops and stuff like that but i didn't really lean towards that being i mean it was seedy but it was done in this way of like there was a tongue-in-cheekness it yeah. was sort of a caricature of it and that ultimately the way that it got played and the way things got steered a little bit here and there it did lead to that heroic conclusion mm. which as i say that that's the way we go in again shadow runs something where a truly heroic conclusion doesn't necessarily always come around. And yeah. I did pepper a little bit of that with the whole, like, oh, well, this is for now. This is the state of affairs as we leave them. Yeah. But that's a more fun way to do it, I think, rather than, yeah, as you say, sticking in the dark territory and then going, yes, and then they all died. <laughs> yeah, and I'd say, I don't, and as you say, I don't think Shadowrun fell out of... Um out of character for us as a show, even, really, it, because of that, because we were all, as you say... Tongue in cheek, you know, it had some elements that maybe I don't tend to lean 100% towards in my own games, or you know, most of the time or anything. But you know, that's that's the beauty of you know, someone else running it, you know, like yourself, sort of like you got to put your own spin on on running the game and what you put into it. Yeah, um, DM's privilege. I mean, I, I had a lot of fun thinking back on that just in terms of designing it, where I knew that that was the leaning that we weren't gonna have like. You weren't going to allow things to just be as they were. They were going, there was going to be an attempt to change this. And that all of the people, all of the worst, unfortunate, seemingly enslaved people within that place, had you talked more to them, they weren't actually doing things that were that terrible. It was all a bit absurd what was going on there. Yeah, I think we made some it, assumptions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, ultimately, I didn't go into it. Maybe there'll be an opportunity one day to go back to that kind of stuff. It'd be fun to see uh, Giles and Dasher, just what they're up to. But Yeah. Um, 
just to bring it down to the question, and I'll only touch on this briefly, but Numenera is the one that I've already mentioned, but that in terms of intimidation and complexity and yeah. all that kind of stuff is, oh, yeah, right up there for me. Hmm. I think for, for me, I think, I mean, yeah, Vampire's quite an intimidating one in my mind as well, but I think one that I'm kind of scared about jumping into if the chance ever came up would be um, the One Ring, the, the Lord of the Rings um, RPG from the sole standpoint that there's so much material for it, and it's such an expansive, um, such an expansive universe to be playing in. It, it, to me, it kind of feels a little bit daunting to even consider where where the game would be set, where you would start, how much of the lore do you need to know. I mean, I'm, I, I know my Tolkien, but I, I can kind of feel that being a very kind of specialised group would be able to pull that off and do it proper justice. Um, not so much from the content point of view, just kind of the, the size of it. I mean, I get what you're saying there. Place. Yeah, I mean, I've got I've got the five E conversion of that that is now out of print, the Adventures in Middle Earth, um, and it mm. was one of the games we were considering playing. Um, uh, in early on, when I was still kind of putting together, like, okay, we're going to do this, then maybe we'll do this, you know, before we'd really gotten going. Um, but I guess it was a similar thing to you, sort of, you know, your point of view. Like, I wasn't. Really, I wasn't too daunted with it, but at the same time, it was kind of like, well, this is sort of not a million miles away from D and D in that it's like a sort of fantasy setting, but also it sort of had the weight of like, okay, well, like you, I know my Tolkien, especially now where I've recently read the Silmarillion and stuff, but it's mm-hmm. it has a different vibe to the D and D stuff that mm-hmm. I think is kind of my more comfortable sort of DMing style being able to, you know, put in weird magic stuff and comedy and stuff that maybe wouldn't... I feel like we may maybe be doing the Tolkien stuff a little bit of a disservice if I made it a bit too comedy sort of style. Not that all everything's going to be comedy really at all, but, like, you know, I mean, it's sort of... Yeah. yeah. It's got yeah, a, it's it's got it's a different balanced, feeling balanced to the it. levity, isn't it? Yeah. Balancing the levity, but also making it feel like a Tolkien story, like an event that could have happened during the War of the Ring or, you know, the Fall of Numenor or you know any of those events yeah. yeah yeah it'd be awesome to do but it would be massive undertaking to get it right I think, yeah for i think involved, that it would take DM. again it is there's a lot more sort of pressure i think with the game like that like you say uh, it, if we're putting it out anyway you know yeah so to to release it you'd need players who are who have as much invested mm. in the background um, they sort of live and breathe the going. source material. Yeah, like usually players can get away with knowing much less about the game itself. Yeah. Um, especially if it's a homebrew setting or, you know, things like that, or you slightly adjust things as a group as you go along. Um, if you're dealing with such a complicated setting, because... Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's there's so many layers of yeah. various going to that. Yeah. Um, you definitely need a group of players that you can trust mm. are as <laughs> don't really want to say invested because you can be invested in the games you're playing without it being maybe like well versed in the law sort of thing. Yeah, like a, yeah. A, a treating the law with like the, maybe the re- you know because it's it's so well established. It is if anything the most well established law. You know, what oh, I mean? yeah. So it's more sort of treating that as I don't know. It, it's a tough one. I get, I get, I get what you're saying though. Yeah. Got to be a Numenor from your Narsil. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. I'm sort of doing one question from each of the people, and then we'll we'll do a loop back round. Um, so we're down to uh, KK, the cool kid, the legendary email champion, as they are known on our server. Um, are there any more Discord roles they can get? <laughs> Um, KK is the holder of is the uh, single holder of being uh, having the Discord role legendary email champion <laughs> because they were the only they were the first person to ever send us an email um, <laughs> in like nearly four years of doing the show so I rewarded them with that I think the way Discord worked you can only have one role at a time so I might be wrong but look you you've already got the one Discord role I think you're fine there KK but <laughs> um, although I guess we could think of more things that we could sort of give out as dis- as rewards kind of thing. We've got the cast members, we've got the well, I've got the Jackbox crew from when we were you've been doing that over the last year um as a role. People who are regularly 
playing Jackbox with us on a Saturday. Um, then there's just regular online people, and then there's KK, the email champion. <laughs> I don't know. We, we could have a think, I guess, and see um, see if there's anything else we could give out as a Discord role. But um, it doesn't come with any privileges other than your name is yellow on the server. Other than... <laughs> in fairness, I think the one Discord server I'm in, I've got nine roles. Oh, well, okay, so you can give out Which multiple. Is... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have a think, yeah. I'm thinking of weird, fun titles more than anything else. But we'll, we'll have a think. We, yeah. <laughs> Let's stick with another one of KK's questions then, because that was quite a quick one. Uh, which is better, ice cream or chocolate? We can also mm. fold another one into this, which is just, do you like ice cream? Yes. Yeah. Love ice cream? <laughs> I find mint, I, love mint ice cream specifically. I have, I, pref- I have more chocolate than I have ice cream. I'm really I'm torn really on this one. Yeah. You're, you're, you're very, you're very, you're likely to like if you if you're too forceful, you can break your teeth on really frozen ice cream or really hard bit of chocolate. So that's true. The dangers there either way. Yeah. <laughs> They're both equally dangerous. They can be. Yeah. No, I I I would go with ice cream. I I'm diabetic, so I don't massively ingest it any great amount. But if I if I have the opportunity and I'm being careful with it, I tend to have something mint flavoured. Mint or raspberry ripple, if I haven't got mint available to me. Mm, I think I'm in agreement. I, I, I would rather lean towards ice cream. It's yeah, it's just nicer generally. Plus you can have chocolate ice cream and that kind of gets both at the same time. So It does. That sounds like a loophole to me. <laughs> it's, a, it's a temporal causality loop of, you know, goodness. I'm gonna go chocolate. I just I I have chocolate more often, and I've had a tub of ice cream in my freezer for a good month and a half now that I haven't finished. So the fact it's there and I just haven't gone for it is, I think I think I've answered my own question there. Do you think Do you think subconsciously you're waiting for the warmer weather when you're going to appreciate the coldness of it the most? No, not really. I just keep forgetting it's there. Um, but yeah, no, even that. Yeah, no, I think I'm 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 more of a chocolate guy than an ice cream guy more than anything. In fact, I only have the ice cream because um, I ordered a pizza and they'd run out of something and the guy gave me a free ice cream. And I was like, okay, cool. I didn't really want it, but okay. I put it in the freezer and my mum ate it and was like, I've eaten your ice cream. So I immediately was like, how dare you eat the ice cream I didn't want? Um, <laughs> so she paid for me to get another one, um, which I also your, didn't your really want. Your was well-founded in that regard, I think. Yeah, that's well my ice cream. Why have you eaten my ice cream? The one that was going to sit there and not be eaten. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a chocolate guy. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Um, I would always have gone with chocolate as well. But um, since we realised that my reaction to da- dairy is actually a full-on allergy. Oof. Um, oh, no. and yeah, so like eating ice cream, I could only eat like a bit. I was really confused. People were like eating a full tub of ice cream in one go. And I was just like... How I would be dead. <laughs> yeah, no, that was just the dairy allergy. Oh, so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so now when I get, you can get non dairy ice cream these days, can't you? Although I don't know what, how good yes, that is. Yes, you can, yeah. You, can get, um, you actually can get a lot of dairy free ice cream now. Um, the difficulty at this point is more that when you find one that you like, it's really difficult to not just eat an absolute ton of it <laughs> because it can be more tricky to get or it's ben and jerry's and then it's never on sale so what you're saying is uh, i'm outnumbered in being leaning towards chocolate here three to one I'm afraid so i'm afraid so aj it's it's a sad day for your for your chocolate membership um <laughs> to be That's strict fine. in this manner it's, I it's never really, really... Either. <laughs> <laughs> um okay <laughs> i have two questions from belry Oh, no. He said, let's just, let's just do it and we'll, we'll, then it's done. Who's the sexiest person you've worked with on a podcast slash stream with and why is it Bellry? Speaking about himself in the third person. <laughs> People that you know, AJ, I mean... I mean, yeah, I, yeah you're, I think you're the only one of us who's had no... Uh, yeah, well, you know, you're definitely the only one of us who's not had any uh, contact with Bellry before and uh, he's right, it is him. <laughs> <laughs> I think I don't. Have I been on a podcast with Bellry? We've definitely streamed with him. I mean, yeah, we've streamed, but not on a podcast. I don't think. Yeah, 
No, there hasn't. He hasn't yet been on pretending with dice. I don't think you've been on. You haven't been on penance with him. No. Um, but we've played a lot of Jackbox on stream together, and uh, so yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Um, Belly is very memorable. <laughs> hey, he's a funny guy. I get I get along with yeah. Belly very well. Yeah, but that yeah, that's a. As I'm a, trying to think of a good answer to the question, mind you. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> I don't have one unless yeah, it's, it's just being like, no, it's it's me because I haven't been on a podcast with you, so <laughs> and, and I'm not going to be awkward and pick somebody else. Yeah, so I guess I'll go. It's for a myself. bit of an awkward question, really, isn't it? <laughs> just a little bit. <laughs> It's pretty much the things... only safe answer is Bell Ring. Yeah, the only safe answer is to just go, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, it's... <laughs> <laughs> For me, it's probably the cowboy boots. <laughs> That's why. I've got um, no so... co- context for this, but I'm just loving the yeah, responses. it's fine. So let, let's... Okay, to get it over <laughs> with then, we'll roll into his second question, which is just breaded or batter. Mm, batter. I'm Ooh, gonna get back. I've, I've been having some. I got the Waitrose um, battered uh, onion rings. I've been doing. Mm. Um, they're quite nice. So I'll, I'll go batter. Very nice. Yeah, battered here as well. There's nothing better than a battered saveloy from Captain Cod around the corner from where I live. Mm. Many feet. Mm. No, nope. I'm gonna go for breaded. Madness. <laughs> Madness. I also like. I also like baked fish. So. Yeah. Yeah. You know what's good breaded is potato croquettes. Mm. They are good. Yeah, you're, making, that, yeah. you're making I'll me think, that. though, have I had them battered and would that be better? Oh, that's a good question. I haven't had them battered. There you go. Mm. <laughs> this, can't, this can't be answered right now. We have to, <laughs> to yeah. the supermarket and then to a, an a chip owner shop of a, yeah, a chip, shop, <laughs> chip shop we can give them to. Yeah. We'll find out. So I think most of us are leaning towards battered, but breaded on dragon's part this time. So I'm, 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 yeah. I'm gonna twi- I'm gonna twist this very quickly. Um, Go for it. Um, what would you say is better, a a battered slash deep fried Mars bar or a breaded Mars bar? I haven't had either. <laughs> breaded Mars bar. Breaded, but yeah, the the uh, the idea of a breaded Mars bar. Yeah, I'm enjoying that. Um, I mean, I, I had would a... kill me. So yeah. <laughs> So I had a bad Mars bar years ago. It was like, I, yeah, I felt like I was going to go into a diabetic coma or something afterwards. <laughs> it, it was rough it's stuff. Heart attack, heart attack inducing, isn't it? <laughs> so, that, well, at least we got Barry's questions out of the way. <laughs> sound relieved, AJ. Well, yeah, I mean, they were a bit awkward, weren't they? Um... <laughs> yeah, a bit, especially since I don't know the guy. I've got yeah. no frame of reference. Uh, I've got three from uh, Nikolai. Um, uh, why is cheese is one of them, which is very awkward to answer. Um, but why is to make AJ happy? I mean, mm. cheese is death. So, <laughs> mm, I, I, I like my cheese. Um, it literally makes my throat close. <laughs> yeah, it's. I have too much of it. Well, he might ask with irony. I ask with conviction. What a piece of work is mozzarella? <laughs> I'm never. I'm. I'm. I'm on a bit of a gouda kick at the moment. I know I've been on it for a little while. I feel like, but mm. it's uh, it's good stuff. But yeah, obviously, mm. still deadly to you, dragon. But um, yeah. The good, good, I'll, I'll say gouda is good. Um, I actually prefer melted gouda. If you pop it on top of something you're cooking in the oven. And let it melt down for about two or three minutes. It, it's just got the right taste on its own. If you haven't like mixed it in with something, it tastes a little bit bland. But if you heat it up, it's yeah, very good. I'm not a hundred percent sure it's actually pronounced gouda because my mum calls it gouda, but I don't. I've heard it as gouda. Yeah, it wouldn't be the first time I've got it wrong. I'm just reading it because you know G O U D A. I'm reading gouda, but go Gouda-da. yeah, the the U throw. Uh, any, I mean, I know for a fact we've got some. Friends from the Netherlands, it's from there. Let me know if I'm getting it wrong. <laughs> That's either Zephyr or Meow. <laughs> um, okay. Let's roll back up to the top then. So back to Jeff. Um, slightly more... Uh, slightly getting away from the, the world of animal fighting. What got you into playing D&D? I guess we could expand this to just RPGs in general. But I guess I just thought it'd be fun to 
pretend to roll some dice and pretend to do stuff. <laughs> but uh, it was the Star Wars one we did first, really, and I was kind of like, that was like, oh, it's Star Wars, and I can make up my own stories, and I can make people have to play through them, <laughs> sort of thing. And I don't know, there's all these numbers. It, it very much scratched like a um, same itch as you know, eleven year old, twelve year old me did with Warhammer forty K. It's like, oh it's it's sci fi stuff and, you know, it's a game and it's you know I don't know. That was kind of how I got into it really. With the Star Wars one and then on to like, oh, there's other stuff, you know. Mm. Yeah. because yeah, I've only ever done it with like with you yourself. Like D D was the first time that I ever did any role playing. In, in this kind of style like yeah. i played video games endlessly and i suppose that's where the ultimate kind of like the the root of the idea is for me is like a familiarity with that as a concept and i suppose over time becoming more and more aware that a lot of the people that wrote the fiction that i was most into had in some way shape or form been inspired by role playing and that was part of their creative process and it really helped them figure out characters and stuff and then that became more and more appealing and then I'm sure that there was a variety of conversations in the lead up to us doing D&D of sort of like, okay, this is an idea and putting it on the table and actually thinking like, okay, we could make this work. And then, yeah, just building up to that point where getting, I think, Jason and Mark on board was the, the crucial factor because like Jason's got a little bit of interest in that stuff, whereas Mark was completely in the dark. Mm. And I don't know. It was an interesting process getting us all together for that, I think, especially because that was for all of us the first time. We were able to pitch it to Mark from the sort of where we'd made films and stuff together. It's like, hey, this is like a, it's like telling a story sort of together kind of thing, you know, mm. more from that angle than the, hey, it's rolling dice and pretending to be a halfling <laughs> kind of thing. But that's what you're going to do, Mark. You're going to roll dice and pretend to be a halfling. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was that choice, obviously, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think... For me, the it kind of started when I was in uh, year ten, going into year eleven. Um, and the school I went to, uh, one of the chaps that I would have been in the air cadets with was in the sixth form, and he um, came along to one of the Warhammer nights that uh, that I'd set up with my ge- geography teacher at the time, where people used to bring their Warhammer armies in. And uh, this guy, uh, we call him Panda. His, his real name is Matt. Anyway, um, Panda came along and said, um, how, "How would you guys feel about trying a D and D?" game and I, I didn't know what it was at the time and then he explained a bit about it and i said yeah i'll give it a go and we did it about four or five sessions after school it was usually once every two weeks and um i played as a halfling barbarian in this kind of uh mini campaign he set up i didn't last more than three sessions um my death was quite terrible and hilarious at the same time um <laughs> i got mauled to death by a giant badger and then knocked into a cesspit <laughs> But it yeah, it was the usual way people go. Yeah, exactly. It's it's it's, it's a night out, isn't it? Um, but that kind of that was kind of my intro to it, and I didn't really pick any, pick anything up on it after that. I mean, I was into Warhammer. I did a bit of forty k, mostly Lord of the Rings. Um, I remember going to Games Workshop with AJ, and we spent the occasional Saturday painting in the shop in Bournemouth. But um, I kind of left the RPG thing alone for years, and then the thing that really brought me back to playing RPGs. Mass Effect, because that came out on the 360, and it really kind of re- reinforced something in me about enjoying playing a character and making the choices and the decisions. It's a video game thing, but it kind of gave me the the kind of want to get back into doing sort of Dungeons and Dragons and other similar games like that. It, and it it really kind of made me enjoy the idea of it again. And most of what I play these days, whether it's video game or tabletop, is kind of RPG things. I mean, I, the problem was I couldn't find groups easily enough who were playing that sort of thing, which is why when Pretending with Dice came along and AJ um, started putting things together there, and you mentioned doing the Star Wars campaign as a kind of a precursor before we started doing the recordings, I thought, yeah, I'll get involved in that. Well, that um, was long before, like I say, the, the, that Star yeah, Wars, was. I mean, the, the podcast yeah. came along like three years after we'd even finished or something, hadn't it? Or something. It yeah, very, very true, very true. But the I think the precursor to that was you running that um, Star Wars game and trying out D&D with that setting. Yeah. That you know, was like your kind of first foray. And uh, I for, for, for all the weird things that happened with that campaign, I did enjoy it. And, um, you know, being on Returning My Dice, I've had the chance to play plenty of other games. And I've also been doing campaigns... Pre, pre-COVID, obviously, I, I did run 
a campaign of my own with some friends over in Ringwood, and uh, that was about five or six characters strong. Hmm. And that went for about a month, about a month and a half overall, I think we played that for. And, um, yeah, absolutely well into it now. And it's it's only because uh, Mass Effect kind of reignited the idea, the appeal of playing as a, another person, but actually making the decisions in a video game rather than just hacking and killing things and following a predetermined story. Things where choices make a difference definitely appealed. And that's kind of where it was for me. Hmm. I can totally get that angle because that's, I think, where I played exclusively video games kind of up till doing it. And, and a lot of my interest was in a lot of those kinds of games like Knights of the Old Republic. Um, and I'd played a ton of other stuff, Pillars of Eternity more recently. Um, all of those have the kind of dynamic where you have your choices, but you're stuck within paths. And I think it comes through in the way that I play all of the things that we've played so far is that like, I like to pick things like I like the true freedom of it. Like the fact that like you can just imagine the scenario and go, right, everything is possible. What are like, I'm not limited to punch the guy in the face or shake his hand. I can say something to him. I could walk away from the conversation. I could do a backflip. All of that kind of weird stuff is just there on the table. And that, yeah, that's ultimately what's so appealing about a lot of the role playing is the, uh, the uh, improvisational aspect, I think. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's also kind of, I think the idea of the stakes really gets reinforced as well. I mean, depending on who you're playing with and who's running the game, anything, anything can happen. I like games that give you that uncertainty, and D and D, you really do have the scope for that. It might not be as grave circumstances or as finite or final, but it's still that kind of oh, I've done this. What's going to happen as a result of that? We've got endless examples we could point to from yeah. previous sessions of just like yeah, that's the way things have gone many many times. It's like here's here's a scenario where there's a couple of obvious things that could happen, and those yeah. obvious things are not going to happen because we're playing. Hmm. <laughs> Yeah. How did you get into games, Dragon? Slightly differently. Um, I did have friends at school who played Warhammer Fantasy. Mm. Um, the thing that always put me off was just how slowly it moves. So um, RPGs are can <laughs> move a lot faster. Yeah. Um, and then starting playing them was when I met Nikolai. Mm. Um, and our uh, game that's on hiatus right now, 2115, is actually a setting um, that we used as a homebrew about nine, ten years ago, I think. Yeah. Um, where we based it off of Cyberpunk 3, um, which is a like a black and white book with like some neon green bit in it. <laughs> and they use like action men to do their the posies and show everything. Um, <laughs> that got pretty wild. It ran for a couple of years. It got quite insane. Quite a lot of stuff happened in that campaign that we would not release in the podcast. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, so that's, that's kind of the thing I sort of missed from... Well, not really. I was going to say, I don't, I don't find it... I'm having to, most of the time, put a huge amount of thought into like, oh, we can't really put this out. But sometimes stuff happens where I'm just like, oh, that's... I'm going to have to cut that or, or whatever. And I kind of miss that from just doing home games because I never play anything other than recorded stuff these days, it seems. Yeah, same. I kind of miss just being like having stuff happen where I'm just like, okay, I don't need to worry about how this is going to come across in <laughs> on a final podcast or something, really. And like I say, it's not a huge concern most of the time because especially with the groups that we've kind of gotten together these days, I think everyone's fairly cognizant of like, okay, yeah, we can't really... You know, we're not going to be pushing too many sort of, I don't know, I'm insane ba- when it, Yeah, not any kind of insane boundaries. You know, we're not going to be getting too weird with, you know. But we, we all know where the line stands, basically, is what I'm trying to say, really. Mm. Um, whereas I, I'm thinking back to, again, I'm not, I'm not going to give examples, but again, <laughs> some weird things <laughs> speaking of that Star Wars, that first Star Wars campaign where I'm just like, Oh yeah, yeah. There's some stuff there that I would not record and put out on a podcast. Yeah, there was. So, uh, but yeah, I mean that happens though. In, in, I say campaigns. Oh, so, it does. Yeah. yeah. 
but yeah. I'm, I'm thinking back to Tempest Squadron, actually. A lot of the stuff oh, that, that um, Ollie yeah. was saying. Oh my a lot God. of it made it in, but like there was some, yeah, there's some stuff there. I'm just like, oh, okay, well, that's coming out. Yeah. Yeah, we're t- <laughs> getting rid of that. Yeah. And it, it, the thing is, at that point, we were able to do this stuff in person. So it was a case of all four of us were there at the, um, at your place. And I think there was a point where we had to stop recording for about 10 minutes because we were all just howling with laughter at something that Ollie had done in character. <laughs> And it's just, you know, the thing well, he, something he said or something he it, did and it just... Yeah. Yeah, well, 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 none of those 10 minutes could go into it because it was just us, like, taking the piss and laughing ourselves into a stupor. Basically, yeah. But then that's yeah. the thing, again, like I say, home campaigns, you don't have to worry about that, but recorded stuff, it's just yeah, like, exactly. okay, nobody's going to want to listen to us laugh for 10 minutes straight about about the same joke or whatever, you know. Yeah. yeah. Or nobody needs to know what Fnock is doing in his quarters on board the ship. Oh, yeah, I took all that out, didn't I? Yeah. <laughs> you did, yeah. There was no context. Every reference to it came Fnock out. Did. Yeah, that was a yeah. running joke throughout that. Every time you guys were doing that, <laughs> Fnock was going off to just knock one out. Um, yeah, exactly. That was, that was the Unknown's pastime on yeah. long journeys through yeah, hyperspace. Yeah, that, that, uh, that wasn't going to stay in. There's a bit of a... No. Yeah, that's a Q and A exclusive. There, I took out all of the masturbation references in Tempest Squadron. <laughs> <laughs> Let's pivot to Klepto's second question. If you were to live in Valana, uh, which is our custom D and D setting, where would be the ideal place to live? Where would be the worst place to live? And what would be your job in this fantasy land? It's quite a tough one. I guess Eden and I know more about the setting than <laughs> than the new two, but. Yeah, yeah with, with the two of us having come up with a great deal of what's on there. I don't know. I know where um, I wouldn't want to live. Yeah. Hmm. Top of that darn mountain. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do, yeah, yeah. Just no. That dude who lived in the cave on top, yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Are, are we picking, like, roles that we think we want? And like positions that we want, or are we trying to like pick like what would my? Are well, you just going to be like I'm going to live universe. in the palace and I'll be the king? <laughs> well, exactly, because it's like whatever. Well, if I'm given opportunity to just pick willy nilly, then no, I'll that's like, an yeah, established character. Power, yeah. <laughs> what have you? So that, that's an easy pick. But otherwise, I'm kind of like, mm, right, which clerical role in which kingdom am I taking? <laughs> that's kind of where I'm at in life. I kind of like. Um, I, I'm thinking back on when we were talking about and coming up with the ideas. Uh, kind of like the kingdom of uh, I, I pronunciation time kingdom of Aurelia. Oh, the one that's basically Switzerland. Yeah, that has its kind of like it's too big for its own boots and is diplomatically a bit of a dickhead. <laughs> I, I'm kind of into that place. <laughs> Just drawn to <laughs> that someone. kind of mindset. <laughs> like, I think it would be a, a fun place to be in terms of like go, go around sniping at people and be a very catty society. It'd be kind of fun. <laughs> I guess I'd be in the. I'd live in the Explorers Guild. Maybe I'd be like planning expeditions or whatever. But in the um, the capital of Valenay, I guess is a. I don't know. That'd be my job, but <laughs> I don't know if I'd be the one going on the expeditions. They all sound pretty dangerous to me, as the one who's <laughs> writing them at this point. Um, yeah, makes sense for a GM to become a uh, guild master after yeah. a fashion. <laughs> just go and hastily open up world anvil and name the guild master after myself now um yeah i don't know i feel like there's a lot of scope it's basically like it's a fantasy setting with most of everything really but like yeah i i guess i i, I don't know with it being a fantasy setting i wouldn't want to live out in the middle of nowhere because there's monsters and things well auric wastes is pretty much as bad as it's getting yeah, yeah. you don't want well, to be I'm, out not, I'm not going anywhere near there yeah yeah <laughs> uh, what's so bad about it it's like it's it mutates people and it's like a burning desert of magical like energy and stuff yeah uh, in the past wizards of great power basically used this place for ridiculous incantations levels of magic that have never been seen since yeah. that have absolutely devastated the land and literally fractured it in places yeah they basically blew up part of the world trying to put a energy shield around the planet um to stop out asteroids it was the whole thing. So it's a bit like Birmingham then? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, back to KK, who says, is there going to be a one-shot soon? I mean, maybe. I want to do more one-shots and things, and I feel like it, we're a bit overdue in actually putting out some gameplay on the podcast. Mm-hmm. So I maybe maybe we should put one together to put out before Star Trek. Um, I think this is a slightly... Uh, 
there's a there's a, there's a hidden question here because when I had um, Johnny uh, Pixel Riffs on for the interview, uh, he'd said uh, we'd said oh you know be up for guesting on a one shot at some point, um, and I know KK is a big fan of his, so I think that may be the hidden question there is when are you going to get Pixel Riffs on to, as a, for a one shot? <laughs> but <laughs> I don't know, maybe soon. I want to I want to play more games. We don't play enough games. Well, we you know we're playing a lot of games at the moment, but they're not being released yet. Um, what, so. what, um, what, what game? What game would you use for a one shot? Uh, probably D and D. Really, um, it's just easy to put the game together. Um, mm. We'll see how it goes. Keep an eye on, I don't know, sky. Yeah, I'll keep the watching the skis, uh, skies. <laughs> 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 um, okay, uh, Pupski, what's the worst ghost in Phasmophobia? I've been playing a lot of Phasmo with um, Nikolai and Meow. Um, I don't know. They're all pretty much the same. Let's say Revenant, because they keep killing us. It's a good reason. Yeah. Quick quick turnaround. Anybody else played that game at all? No. no. Horror game is not really my thing. Fair enough. So, yep, that's that one. <laughs> uh, okay, Jeff gave a lot of questions. We're back around to him again. Uh, we're slowly getting through. I think we've we've basically burned our way through all of the actual serious questions at this point okay um, let's see if we can steer any of this to podcast talk then <laughs> yeah <that's, laughs> well okay there's, we a two, there's a two-part one here from jeff which again is literally just making an in-joke which is how many kids have you got did you abandon them all um <laughs> just the jackbox in joke that i am i have about how many what was the number given I can't even think. I'm trying to think of how this of children that I've had that I've abandoned, including Klepto, which is why she wanted to be my referred to as my favourite child. Yeah, um, at, at, at times you've become referred to as the all father, <laughs> as, as like the the father to all in some respects. Yeah. It, it's this weird nebulous concept. I'm kind of into it as a running joke. It's the longest honest. running joke we've had. I will say that. AJ would make a good Odin. <laughs> you got the beard, the long hair. Just need the eye patch. I think I could pull off an eye patch. So, how many kids do I have? Not even I know. I don't even know, Jeff. <laughs> All I can tell you is most of them are Steven Tyler's. Um, <laughs> I'm just taking the fall for him. Uh, okay. <laughs> we, could, we could really quickly crack through the rest of Jeff's, actually. Um, anime, what's the crack? I don't watch a lot of anime. Bellry is the, the main anime guy, I think, in our little circle. Um <laughs> I've consumed a pretty decent amount. I'm I'm very familiar with like all of the main tropes and the types. Yeah, and I've watched like the likes of Dragon Ball Z and Berserk and Trigun and all that kind of stuff. What's the crack? Um, a variety of things. Anime covers everything in a weird way. There's always yeah. a weird angle to it. Yeah. Especially with some of the early Pokemon episodes. That's the only real anime thing that I've digested. But when you go back and look at the the kind of non um, the non-westernized versions of the episodes. There's a lot of things in there that are pretty questionable at times. Oh yeah, <laughs> pulling guns on people, and uh, I'm sure there's a uh, there's an episode of Pokemon that's banned in the West, um, or that never got translated, where James and Jesse enter a bikini competition, and yeah, so James has got like, breasts. I've seen that yeah, one though. In, I definitely in, saw that one over here. Really? Yeah. Before Maybe it was a particular wide. scene because I'm sure I saw something about like a scene where he was inflating the boobs and talking about having to constantly do this. Or Maybe something. they just took that, that was... scene out then because I definitely remember yeah. watching that episode. Changing um, guns to finger pointing is one of the classics that's happened over here. Yu-Gi-Oh had a lot of it, where <laughs> a lot of characters inexplic- inexplicably have guns pointed at them, but it's a it change to lots of finger pointing and sort of like very aggressive posturing in the West, <laughs> which is always fun. It's yeah. absurd. That's that's ultimately the stuff from the anime. I would say that drew me in. Mm-hmm. And just to finish up, yeah, it's it's always got an absurd angle. Whether that's gratuitous violence, gratuitous weirdness, like there's something to it. Mm. Uh, Jeff's yeah. final question then: uh, How many actual dice do you own? Uh, not that many, really. I've never been like a dice fiend. You know, you get people who are like, "Oh, I must have the shiny." Um, but I've got like three sets of. Um, just cheapo sort of seven quid for the whole set sort of plastic ones that I use regularly that I got off Amazon and I've somewhere in my house, I don't know what it is, I got one of those 
uh, Chessex like bag things that's got like sixty four dice in or something like that, and that's it. That's all I've got really. Um, so and that though I don't use that the Chessex ones because I've realised they're really cheaply plastic injection molded and they they <laughs> none of them are balanced properly. Um, yeah. But yeah, I I've never been I've never been one for like dice collecting really so much. I have ordered another set actually. Um, I've ordered from Modiphius the Star Trek uh, Science Division ones which gives me um some extra D20s and some uh D6s with the the right logo on so we know when we've done damage and things <laughs> they've yet to arrive. I own a grand total of zero dice. I need to rectify this and get at least one set I suppose. That's true every time we play you're either we're either doing it uh, digitally with the dice rolling board or you've been over here using a set of mine. <laughs> yep. If you're buying your own I'm going to recommend D and Dice, mostly because I can give you a discount code. Yeah. <laughs> Do it. Plug oh, the code. Go. Plug. <laughs> it quits in. Plug the stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I think I I have a I have three sets of dice. One that's incomplete. I've lost a couple, but um, you know you get these kind of weird. Not they're not solid color. They got this kind of like wispy kind of a pattern to them. Um, but they got the gold numbers. I got a black set. A, half incomplete green set and i do have an a set which is actually got like elven runes carved into them and the numbers are printed in this kind of Ooh, fancy. obsidian black yeah um but I, I i get i don't go and collect dice really i mean most of the time at the moment obviously because we're not doing things in person just use um one of the dice bots mm. but so uh, yeah I, i'm not a dice i'm not a dice collector really i mean if i see a nice set of dice like a really good looking set of dice that's thematic of something I'm into like Star Trek or whatever, then maybe I'll put the money down, but I generally don't do this enough to warrant having a massive selection to pick from. As long as I've got at least two of everything, I'm fine with it. I did back the Kickstarter for the ice dice, like ice mold. So you can make ice yeah. dice. Oh, and yeah, I don't I remember, that. remember oh. whether it's arrived or not. I don't think it has. No, yet. they haven't. No, no they haven't. Soon, soon I'll be able to make my own dice from frozen water. Yeah, what a world we live do in. Do about four or five rolls, and they'll melt. What a time to be alive! Um, I think you can guess from the fact that um, penance have an affiliate discount code with Dean Dice. Mm. I have slightly more dice than I need. <laughs> when you say slightly, probably got about ten or eleven set. Wow, that are actually mine. As opposed to like the ones that I've got that go out to patrons or like are part of giveaway prizes. Mm. Um, ah, right. Some of them have been gift. Actually, most of them have been gift. A couple are Kickstarter sets, um, and the ones I've bought myself are mostly some of the metal ones that D and Dice mm. sell because they are so pretty. Like it's really dangerous. Like, having a discount code for there is really dangerous. <laughs> The temptations okay. there to be like, oh, I could, but I could have them slightly cheaper. <laughs> yeah. Although I think it's worse for Bad Banfa because yes. on both of our Discord servers, um, she is actually a dice goblin. <laughs> so anytime I like, I put, I, like, I do like the promo images for like Instagram or anything. It's always like, oh, oh. I think she posted a photo of her dice. It's like a bowl, was it? Or is it's it like a container? It's a candy jar. Yeah, it's a big, there's a lot of dice. Way more than it, I mean, <laughs> way more it, than it'd ever need for anything. It, yeah. You could use a different set every day for a year <laughs> and still not roll every dice. I, I'm always, yeah. I'm forever chuckling at that giant titanium one that Bellary's got that puts holes in tables. <laughs> I've got a friend who's got it's like a set of like three or four giant D twenties and they are various different solid metals. Mm. <laughs> they're they're a good like two and a half, three inches across. <laughs> the depleted uranium dice and just throw them at tanks. <laughs> <Jesus>. <laughs> uh, very quickly on my just on the dice, I have a question for everyone here. How much stock do you guys put into the weight of a dice? Because I know people that are really kind of pernickety about how weighty a dice is, like if it's not rolling randomly enough and all that. I mean, you guys got any feelings on that? 
I mean, it's definitely a thing that some dice aren't made well and are, you know, off balance sort of thing. Yeah, it's it's very much most of the mostly I get dice through places that are fairly well known for doing dice. Um, whether it's grade eight Dean dice or it's some of like the indie makers. Um, and they are usually really good that if they know some sets aren't going to be balanced, they'll put that on the listing. Like with some hand pours, you can't really guarantee how balanced it's going to be. Mm. Um, but in general, with like just by weight, I don't think weight makes very much difference. No, no. I mean, I've got some, like the, the ones I use are plastic and they're not weighty at all. And they they seem to be fine. But then I've used some really hefty ones. That, I mean, I, it has, I suppose, got the psychological thing of feeling like, oh, you know, this is this is pretty hefty. It's a meaningful role or whatever. But, that, you know, mm-hmm. yeah, I don't, I don't really put a lot of stock in it. I mean, I, I suppose this kind of comes with the sort, whole sort of not really being a dice gremlin sort of thing either. That, like, I'm perfectly happy with the sets I've got, really. So I'm not there going like, oh, I wish they were one way or another sort of thing. You know, I'm rolling them for the numbers more than for the sort of mm-hmm. the heft of them i guess yeah it's, it's it's more about using them for what they're you got them for rather than worrying about their overall performance if they roll well, no, no, roll not right so much. you get a number you're okay no i'm just saying i'm saying that there's a difference between like ones that are ge- genuinely unbalanced in which case that's like you say a manufacturing error or whatever and then i probably won't use them um mm. like those ones in that chessex bag i've got you know they're just a bit cheap and i'm pretty sure they they don't feel right some of them um mm. but i uh, yeah, i mean i say i'm not they're going like oh i need a heavy one to you know <laughs> feel like it's right or anything but, you know but yeah i don't know what i'm saying it, yeah anyway yeah okay yeah. i think it gives it gives a different feel to it um but it doesn't i can't see that it would really have much of an impact other than potentially um, with like solid metal dice, um, it's more likely for them to be balanced. Mm. I would say, yeah, um, it's easier to have flaws in um, acrylic or resin. Mm. Um, but then, like some of the dice I have, I like I use that set because they're really pretty. Yeah, <laughs> so, you know. Yeah. There's, there's something to be said for the aesthetics of a dice set rather than like what they look like rather than what they're made of. Yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm not um, like there's some people who are like uh, superstitious about oh no, these are oh, they've rolled too many ones in a row and that I'm not anything mm. like that. Um, no. So yeah, I, I, I use the ones I I do use because I like I bought them for that reason as well as because I like the way they look, sort of thing. Mm. So yeah, that's why I use them. Cool. Okay, we've only got a couple of questions left. We're getting there. <laughs> KK's final one. Uh, do you play Minecraft or do any of the cast members play Minecraft? Um, I have tried it out. I had the PS4 one I bought very cheaply and I don't know whether it was just the angle of my TV or whether I, I found this with certain um, first person games. I started getting motion sick mm. generally when it's too fast moving and stuff, you know, swinging around and stuff. So I think I might just have been sat at an odd angle of my TV Um but I definitely got it with older. Uh, I tried the original Far Cry and I started getting motion sick. Something about the the motion blur and that didn't really go with me. But yeah, I, I don't know. I, I don't. I kind of. I kind of played it for a couple of hours and I didn't really get into it that much. I can see the appeal of it, um, and I definitely have played games with a similar thing. Like well, even you and I did a lot of Terraria together and that. Yeah, Terraria, Starbound. Um, so that kind of building type thing is definitely. You know, I do enjoy that, but I just never really got into Minecraft. Really? Yeah, likewise. Yeah, yeah. I did try Minecraft once or twice, but never really stuck with it. I think the only game I played that's anything similar is Valheim. See, I could I couldn't get into Valheim. I could when I found the cheat codes for it. Because <laughs> <laughs> I didn't play it online. I just played. I did well, with the games like that. I just tend to play on my own offline thing and just wander around and then try and build something really cool. I don't tend to do the online. So I very rarely play online games actually, because more often than not, I end up getting in a server with absolute douchebags and it's just, <laughs> just it's not it's not fun yeah i play games yeah. to chill out usually and that's not yeah. to say i do stuff you know put it on easy mode for anything like that but there's nothing less fun to me than some idiot online coming along and be like oh i'm gonna wreck your stuff for no reason 
sort of thing. Yeah. It's just like, oh, you know. Yeah, I think Rust was really plagued by that when that came out. <clears throat> Remember Rust? I had friends that started playing this, oh, this is the greatest thing ever, and then the next day, this one was working at Kerry's, one of them came in looking really forlorn. I was like, what's the matter? And he said, some bugger got onto our... Um, and got got hold of us and uh, ruined our encampment on Rust, destroyed everything, took all our stuff. And I was like, well, you'll build it back, won't you? And they're like, no, I don't want to do it anymore. It's ruined. The fun's been ruined. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's a very real problem, unfortunately. Griefing is one of the most annoying things with online gaming. So yeah. survivalist games where you got to kind of manage things like Rust and Ark, the original version of Ark, Survival Evolved and all that, doesn't really appeal if i'm going to play something with friends i'd rather it's something that's got set gameplay set rules and we can just have fun doing the exact same thing and we don't lose anything as a result i suppose minecraft there's a survival mode to it and that i suppose it's sort of similar yeah, vein. Is. just to tie it back to the question a little bit <laughs> yeah yeah uh well yeah i mean kk i know you're a big fan of like we said earlier you're a big fan of pixel riffs who does uh, a lot of minecraft stuff and i say i haven't got anything against minecraft and that i just didn't really get into it and that and um yeah so that's that. So final question, which again is maybe a little bit out of, um, it, it's slightly more serious, but it's less, uh, it's a less podcast net connected. Also from uh, Nikolai, who's your favorite video game voice actor? Ooh. Hmm. So that's a difficult question. A little bit different. Gotta I, think I about can it. answer straight away. Go for it. I have no idea because I'm terrible <laughs> at remembering names. <laughs> so even if I identify one, I won't be able to tell you what character it is, and then I won't be able to tell you who acted them. Well, I was going to say, have you got a character that you like the voice of? Because we might be able to find out who did it. But, um... but I don't remember the names of characters either. Well, even if it's just like, oh, that that one person who was doing this thing, or or the main no. person for this. Okay, fair enough. Really not. <laughs> And they got the opposite problem, where like I've played so many games and I love so many different voice actors for so many different reasons. I've got, I've got a real love for bad like Sega arcade games. And, oh, and there the, was some uh, terrible stuff in that era. House of the Dead Two yeah. is one of my all-time favourites in terms of the voice acting, and that is just so stupendously so awful, cheesy, and over the top, and <laughs> yeah. I don't want to die. Is this things like that? They're just oh, I love it, but. Oh. What about Resident what? Evil? The first Resident Evil on PlayStation, the voiceover work on that was atrociously bad, yeah, was but some it was something stuff, charming. It? <laughs> it really was something charming about it. Oh, you were almost a Jill sandwich there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, there's some bad stuff in there. It's great, Let's split up, look for survivors, and get out of here. <laughs> oh, oh Jill, the master of lockpicking. Oh, that was the, yeah, that was the, the only choice of... moment. Yeah. Um, in terms of actual actors, though, who pops up in stuff? Who do I like? David Hater, I think, is uh, kind yeah, of a classic. Solid Snake. Yeah. Solid Snake. He's pretty good. Um, it took me forever to realise he actually voices um, the Jedi, one well, of the male Jedi in um, The Old Republic. Yeah, he's one yeah. of them. Um, yeah. I'm trying to think. who uh, Steve Bloom, I like. He's in everything. Um, he's in mostly cartoons and stuff. He does games and things as well. He does one of the... Cro- he does um, Grunt in the second... And third Mass Effect. Um, I need to check his name, but um, the guy that does the voiceover work for Disco Elysium does a really fantastic job. The narrator. Mm. I know the um, voice you mean. I haven't got that far in it on my playthrough yet. But let me look him up real yeah. quick just to give him his dues. Um, and the name of the guy is uh, Lenville Brown, by the way. Okay, um, I haven't heard that name before. Yeah, he's uh, he's. I think he's completely sort of unknown in the voice acting scene, um, best known for providing vocals to the London-based ska slap slash rap fusion band Maroon Town. Okay. Who I've never well, heard I haven't of. heard of them either. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. But he, he does fantastic work on that. I'm just thinking about, I mean, I mean, as I'm playing through Mass Effect, I'm doing, I mean, I, I always tend to go uh, Female Shepherd just because I prefer the voice acting, but I guess, um, which is relevant to the question. So I guess Jennifer Hale, who's also in a lot of stuff, um, mm-hmm. Basically doing this, you know, that sort of Commander Shepard voice for three games is sort of a little bit kind of what I'm used to with Mass Effect <laughs> sort of thing. Um, I always I enjoy um, catching John DiMaggio because yes. there's always some yeah. little hint of Bender in almost every voice that he does where it's sort of like, hang on, hang on, I think that's him. <laughs> yeah, I thought um, when I was playing Cyberpunk, I thought Jackie Wells was um, John DiMaggio to begin with. And I was like, I it, doesn't, that as well. it doesn't quite sound like him. I looked it up and it's not him. 
No, they had a similar I, I sort of similar. Yeah. yeah, I had the same thought. I thought that sounds really familiar. And again, like, yeah, I was disappointed to find out it wasn't who I thought it was. Well, I wasn't disappointed. I just was like, hey, I thought that was John Dimaggio. And I looked up and it, was, it had something of a, you know, a film about him. But um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. There's a lot of actors I like, I'd say so. But yeah, I guess because I'm currently doing Mass Effect, let's go with Jennifer Hale. And yeah. <laughs> AJ, very quickly, um, John Dimaggio. Did he voice Wacker in Final Fantasy X? He did. He did. Yeah. Yes, he did. Yeah. And Kamari, but Kamari yeah. doesn't have very many lines, so. No, he was like the silent. Yeah. He was the silent type, wasn't he? He's got like five lines in the whole game or something. Yeah. Still a cool character though. Yeah. Um, I don't, for, for me, um, I'm, I'm gonna, I've got, I'm gonna go with two: one male and one female. Um, male, it's, I had a bit of a, had to decide between them, but I think I can't remember his name, and I apologise, but the guy who voices Geralt of Rivia. In the video games. Oh, yeah, he works at Bournemouth Uni, doesn't he? I believe he does, yeah. He's, yeah. It's just something about that kind of, um, that mm. voice. And he just the delivery of... Come on, Roach. Oh, well, yeah. I'm not quite gravelly enough. Mm. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's, I don't know, Geralt of Rivia, the way that he portrays it, it's absolutely brilliant. Yeah. It's really weird because I've, I've, re- I've listened to the audiobooks of the original novels and um, Geralt of Rivia actually sounds more like um, somebody from Sheffield. Oddly enough, <laughs> which is really strange. But no, the, the chappy voice is Geralt of Sheffield, yeah. <laughs> the, the chappy voice is Geralt in the video games, definitely. For female, I'm going to say Marina Sirtis, because she's done she quite do a bit of video stuff, game work. She? Yeah, yeah she's XCOM. She played, uh, she was. Uh, she did voiceover for uh, a character in War of the Chosen. That was the that, that whole pack was quite fun, because I was just like, I was playing yeah. through it, I was like, oh, well, there's... Most there's of the Michael TNG Dawn. crew, except for Patrick yeah, Stewart. Exactly. Wolf, <laughs> yeah. I think Wolf was there. I think Jonathan Frakes was in it. Yeah. Marina Sirtis. But the, I think for Marina Sirtis, for me, the one that really kind of chilled me, this goes back again, back to Mass Effect. Yeah, she, she voiced um, one, Matriarch. Ma- yeah, Benazio. She was Matriarch. And um, just, the, I think Marina Sirtis, she has a voice that, regardless of whether she's playing a goodie or a baddie, that something about the way she speaks, it really kind of it gives you that kind of sort of feeling that that, that is a sinister person or that is somebody you can trust. It's quite recognisable. It's, it's very much like a, oh, there's a Councillor Troy again kind of moment. <laughs> kind of, yeah. But it's a, a something about the way she delivers her dialogue in whatever the character is. It just, you, you can't, you get absorbed by it, I think. She's got a very, she's very good at capturing your attention with the things she says. I mean, even if the dialogue is like ridiculous and just sort of gibberish. I mean, a lot of the ex still kind of pretty ridiculous. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. But that's kind of my thing. Like, whatever she's saying as part of the dialogue, she's got a way of captivating your, capturing your attention. Fair so fine. I would say Marina Sirtis, yeah. Okay, well, I guess, I guess that, I mean, if anybody, unless anybody else has anything to add, that's kind of all the questions. Um, yeah, not particularly. No? I think we've, uh, we've covered some fun stuff, yeah. some interesting, uh, diverse topics, to say the least. Yeah, it's been good, yeah. It's been nice to hang out and talk. I mean, as you said, AJ, it's a hangout session with uh, answering questions in no particular order. So Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I, I do enjoy doing these Q&As. They're always a little bit different and we get some interesting stuff. Um, we do them every once in a while. Uh, if, if any listeners aren't on our Discord uh, server, go ahead and join. All the questions today, as I said earlier, were um, provided to us by users of our Discord uh, server. Um so yeah, go ahead and join. Um, the link is in our Twitter bio and and whatnot. But um, yeah, I think well, I mean, uh, thanks so much for hanging out with me, guys. This has been a fun little anniversary episode for everybody. The actual anniversary is on Monday, but um, yeah, this is uh, it's been fun. Yeah, thanks yeah. for having us along. Likewise, yeah. Where, where can people find you and your stuff? Uh, you can usually find me online um, under the name Penance RPG. I run our social media or as dragon underscore PRPG. Uh, we, you can check out our podcast over on penancerpg.com. And if you are also a Dice Goblin or buying presents for a Dice Goblin <laughs> or other, you know, TTRPG tabletop accessories, if you go to dndice.co.uk and use the code penancerpg, you get 10% off. Um, well, you can catch me online uh, under the name Monkey Magic Eden, just about everywhere. Um, and I stream semi regularly on uh, Wednesdays at the moment. I'm going to be doing Disco Elysium, as mentioned. Um, and on Saturdays, I've been doing Clone Hero. And last week was a bit different. I did a big, long Clone Hero stream. 
<laughs> AJ, you missed this, but I streamed the entirety of Shrek on Clone Hero. I, I yeah, I, I heard about it. <laughs> yeah, it was. <laughs> it was quite an experience. <laughs> an hour and a half of playing the game and playing the film, as it were. Um, but normally we would do um, 4 p.m. till 6, Clone Hero, which is Guitar Hero bootleg stuff, basically. Um, and from then, it's 6 p.m. onwards with Jackbox, which is party games, telling jokes, drawing stupid pictures, trivia stuff. Um, we've had a variety of random people join us over the weeks. There's a regular cast and crew, as AJ's mentioned, with the roles within the uh, Discord server. Yeah, so, so if you join us, crew you become a regular, then yeah. you become one of those people. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Come and join us for that. Mm. Mm. Um, well, I don't tend to stream or anything like that, but if you want to find me, uh, you can find me on the Pretending with Dice Discord server as Marcus Malice. Uh, and if you're musically inclined, you can also find me on SoundCloud. Uh, if you go to soundcloud.com slash Marcus Malice, uh, you'll find me uh, warbling away to various um, music covers. I do vocal covers predominantly for heavy metal bands. Um, but you can also find me in a more traditional kind of original band setting if you search for Broken Source. We're on Spotify, iTunes, YouTube Music, and we're also on Instagram at Broken Source Band. Awesome. Um, okay, so yeah, as always, uh, you can find us on uh, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, all of which we're at Pretend With Dice. Uh, as we've mentioned previously, uh, feel free to, I mean, we'd love for you to feel free, whatever. I'm not going to cut this bit. Um, we're we'll very free. Yeah. <laughs> We'd love for you to join our Discord server, the uh, links to which are in our Twitter bio and the contact page of our uh, Podbean site. They're also, I, I just, I forgot I put them there. There is a link on the sidebar of our Podbean page on, on it, just in general saying join us on Discord. So there's a big button there you can click and it will get you into the server. Um, a lot of fun stuff goes on there, fun chatting, and as I say, it's, it's kind of the home base for our for the uh, Jackbox sessions and things as well. And yeah, come and, come and hang out with us if you're a Discord user. Um, I think that's pretty much it, really. I've uh, we've got our Ko-Fi page. If uh, the spirit moves you to check us a, a few of your hard-earned currency units, um, but as always, the podcast will remain free. So um, yeah, it's just nice, and it helps cover our. Uh, hosting costs and whatnot um but uh yeah don't feel obligated but it's nice if it's there i feel like i don't put that link out there very often but it's <laughs> uh ko-fi.com ko-fi.com slash pretending with dice and uh yeah that's pretty much it um i pretty i think we'll be back in two weeks time with another bonus episode we're not quite ready to start releasing our star trek thing just yet um but yeah as we had mentioned earlier maybe there'll be a one shot coming up soon at some point keep an eye on our social medias and the discord server and such so um yeah uh i, I guess this is the ending of the episode <laughs> it's going well. As, as, well yeah i know what i'm doing i've posted a podcast before Despite evidence to the contrary, I think there's a stop you, button somewhere on here. You, you've done very well so far, AJ. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> well, good, goodbye, everybody. Live long and prosper. <laughs> okay. Bye. See you all later. Bye. Bye.